Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Vanessa if you are new here. Now this week's video is going to be very different than any video I've ever posted on my channel before. This video and this topic has been something that I've thought about for a while ever since I was in high school, yet I've never had an experience like I've had this week that I really felt compelled to sit down and make a video. So I am Christian, Catholic to be specific. I am conservative and I go to a California State University. Now, I'm very vocal about my opinions. I will write papers about what I wanna write papers about. So if my professor asks me to write a paper about women being oppressed, I instead write a paper about how women aren't oppressed. Um, my professor will ask me to write a persuasion paper. I'll write a persuasion paper talking about how babies in the womb are babies. And this has always been something, this has always been something that I've done my entire life. It's a part of my personality. But going to college, I've experienced a lot of pushback from my professors, which is to be expected. But recently, in an art class, Class, I had to write a blog post about a specific movement that I am a part of and I decided to write my blog post about the pro-life movement. I was expecting some pushback from my professor, however I was not expecting the pushback that my professor gave me on this blog post. So I'm going to preface this, I'm going to tell you guys a lot about the assignments, I'm going to be reading my blog post to you guys today. I'm going to be reading the response that my professor gave me to the blog post and I'm going to be reading my response back to my professor. Now if you want to read my blog post in full then I suggest looking at the description bar because I have it written in full down below. I will be reading it out to you but if you guys want to read it for yourself it will be down below. I also will include a whole article talking about this entire assignment that I have been given and screenshots of things. So check out that article as well. I also have timestamps down below so if you want to skip ahead because you're tired of one part or you want to get to like the juicy parts, please look in the description bar for those timestamps. So to preface this a little bit, I'm going to explain the project a little bit. So to graduate college, you have to take a civic learning class and you have to do a civic learning assignment. And so I took an art class to meet this requirement. Mind you, this is an art class. This is art in urban context where we look at basic like street art, we look at graffiti, we look at art like that and we comment on it, we write papers on it. And so throughout the semester, I've written papers about things that I want to write about. So for instance, she's asked us to write about an artifact or an art piece and I would write about Catholic art pieces because that's just that's just how I am. So when we received the assignment that we had to go out and write a paper, write an article about a movement that we are a part of, the first movement that came to mind for me was the pro-life movement. So for this project, we all had to create blog posts under this arts blogger that my professor created for the class. And the art blogger is described as, welcome to the art blog created as part of the civic engagement requirements of this course. In this blog, students will identify a major social issue that affects them and their communities. After conducting brief research on the issue and sharing their personal feelings, students will locate members of their communities who are also affected by the same social issue. Basically for this project, we had to write a blog post about a social movement that we are a part of. We had to talk about the history, we had to talk about statistics, and we had to talk about the relevance to the author. So I decided to choose the pro-life movement. So I sat down and wrote a long article about the pro-life movement, about the history of Margaret Sanger. I talked about the amendments, and we're gonna get into it when I read the article to you today right now, but I wrote an article about the pro-life movement. Now, I was expecting my professor not to entirely like this because I go to a liberal school. So right now, I'm going to read you guys the comments she left me on my article, and I will further explain why this caught me so much off guard. So on my article, she wrote, Hi, Vanessa. Thank you for your time and efforts into this project. 
While your opinions are certainly valid, I would like to state that just by showing that a member of an organization has ill intent doesn't prove that a whole organization is ill in its intent. Would it be a fair argument if I said that Catholic Church is ill-intended based upon the history of many of its leaders and its history is rich in murder, violence against groups of people, rape, etc.? Also, to be correct, from a medical standpoint, aside from spiritual beliefs upon conception, a baby is not formed. It is simply a cluster of cells. Many doctors defer to pregnancy simply as a medical diagnosis. In fact, referring to it as a baby is technically wrong. A baby does not form until the cells form together to form a heartbeat, which does not occur until about the eighth week, at which point it becomes a fetus. Thank you for your time and effort into this project, and you are free to publish your post. So before we move on, I'm just gonna explain the last part where she says I'm free to publish my post. Basically, we had to tell her when we were done with our article and we had to leave it in a draft form on Blogger until she approved it and then we can publish it. She left me this comment on Canvas, which is a student website where we submit homework. And everyone in my class could see what she commented on my article without ever having to read my article because what she commented on was a reflection that I wrote on this forum post on the Canvas website where I talked about how fun this project was, what I would have done differently. This is where she left the comment there. So I can see what every other person got as their comments. And when I looked at every other person's comments, I saw that no one else got pushback. Everyone got, thank you for your work. You're amazing. You're so, you're so brave for writing this. Instead, I was the only one that got a pushback comment. Now that's fine. You know what? Like she said, my opinions are valid and so are hers. But what really caught me off guard here was the first paragraph where she brings up the Catholic Church. In my article, which I'm going to be reading to you, I never once mention that I'm Catholic. This was something that I had shared with the class prior that she decided to bring into her comments. She could have chose any other organization, institution in history to prove her point, yet she decided to bring up the Catholic Church because she knows that I hold my faith very close to my heart. She decided to undermine my entire arguments by bringing up the Catholic Church and its shortcomings, but we'll get into that later. Then in the second paragraph, she mentions when a baby becomes a baby from a medical standpoint, aside from spiritual beliefs. The thing is, is my article is not about when a baby becomes a baby. It's not even about the process of abortion. My article is about the ill intent of Margaret Sanger, which we're gonna get into when we read the article, but it's almost as though this professor didn't read my article and that she's putting words into my mouth and trying to make me look kind of like an idiot in front of my class. But without further ado, let us read this article that my professor just didn't like. So like I said, you can read this article that I'm reading to you in my blog down below. It is called the Pro-Life Movement article. Now there's also another link down below that is called the Professor's Response to the Pro-Life Movement article. And I include that there because I explain what grade I got on the post, when it was posted, I explain more about the project and her response, but also in that article, the Professor's one, I include screenshots from the original article that she read. Now, what I'm gonna to read to you guys today is the exact same article that she read minus some spelling errors. I suffer from dyslexia. I also am lazy to proofread. So what I submitted to her had some spelling errors, had some grammatical errors. And I went ahead and I fixed them before publishing this article on my Catholic blog. So if you wanna validate and make sure that what she read in class is the same thing that I'm reading to you now, then please go check out that professor's response article because I have screenshots. You'll see how horribly I spelled amendments. It's actually cringeworthy. So I just want to let you guys know that before someone tries to invalidate this entire video. There are some spelling changes because I have dyslexia and I didn't proofread it beforehand. 
But anyways, let us get into the article that my professor read and had that response to. After this, we're going to be looking at her response again. Keep in mind what she claimed I said in my article and keep in mind what she said as we read through this. This is fairly lengthy, so if you guys want to skip ahead because you've already read it or if you want to read it by yourself and not have me read it, then go to the timestamps. But if you want to hear where I emphasize certain things, then just keep on watching. So let's read the pro-life movement article by Vanessa, that one Catholic girl. History, brief overview. The pro-life movement, often referred to as the anti-abortion movement or the right to life movement, is a group of individuals who wishes to uphold the right to life for every individual from conception until natural death. The legality of abortion has changed over the years. According to the National Abortion Federation, abortions have been done for thousands of years, but the legality changed in the 1800s. During the 1800s, abortion became illegal in the United States. The right to life movement stands behind the belief that we all have the right to life, that the right to life is a human right, and no one should be able to infringe upon it. The pro-life movement seeks to inform people on the abortion movement and inerrant rights people have to life. The pro-life movement has been around since the time the right to life has been infringed upon and will continue until no one's right to life is infringed upon any longer. The legality of it all. One of the most groundbreaking events that happened that changed the world and the view of abortion and the right to life was the passing of Roe v. Wade in 1973. This is a Supreme Court decision that many individuals have heard about, yet have little knowledge on. The decision of Roe v. Wade was the right granted to women that they could legally have the right to an abortion due to the 1st, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 15th Amendments in the Constitution. These amendments grant citizens the right to privacy. The decision did not grant the right to abortion, but that abortion is permissible if it fell into the boundaries of the right to privacy amendments. When we look at the history behind those amendments of the right to privacy and the use and justification for them, it leads to a greater understanding of the right to privacy. These amendments were used and greater defined due to the Griswold versus Connecticut constitutional ruling. The Griswold versus Connecticut ruling in 1965 was an appeal on the Connecticut law passed in 1879 that banned the use of contraception in their various forms. The Griswold versus Connecticut case argued and passed that it was illegal for anyone to infringe on the privacy of married couples in their own home when it comes to the use of contraception. Although certain groups were against this case ruling due to various reasons, many can stand behind the ability and the right to privacy of an individual to use contraception in their own home. When the case of Roe v. Wade came to light in the 70s, many assumed that the same amendments could be used to argue the right to abortion. Some claim that abortion is a private matter. They claim that the right to privacy is the right to abortion, since the act of abortion is a private choice between a woman and her physician. But is abortion actually a private matter, and therefore fall under the grounds to the right to privacy? Let us look at the amendments in question. The summaries of the amendments used in this section are courtesy of the Right to Privacy article written by Tim Sharp. The First Amendment protects the privacy of beliefs. The Third Amendment protects the privacy of the home against the use of it for housing soldiers. The Fourth Amendment protects privacy against unreasonable searches. The Fifth Amendment protects against self-incrimination, which in turn protects the privacy of personal information. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. This has been interpreted as justification for broadly reading the Bill of Rights to protect privacy in ways not specifically provided in the first eight amendments. The right to privacy is most often cited in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which states, 
no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. When we look at these amendments further, we can see that the right to privacy in regard to abortion only pertains to the 5th and 14th Amendments, which were the leading amendments in the ruling of the Griswold v. Connecticut case. But even though it pertains to the topic of abortion, does it allow for the right to abortion? Let us look further. The Fifth Amendment pertains to personal information. One could argue that abortion falls under the right to privacy when it comes to personal information. But when the state and federal government becomes involved in the abortion, it no longer falls under the grounds of the right to privacy in this case. State and federal governments become involved when they have some inclusion in the matter, for example, tax-funded abortions. The Fourth Amendment speaks about the right to not be infringed upon by law when it comes to deprive the person of the right of life, liberty, and property. But does abortion deprive any person of those three rights, life, liberty, property? Yes, but not who people assume it infringes upon. The individual who is being infringed upon in this matter are the rights of the unborn baby, not the rights of the mother. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights Article 1 states, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article 2 states, Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration, without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Article 3 states, Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of person. From this declaration from the United Nations, we can see that the right to life of an individual would be infringed upon if the right to privacy included the act of abortion. When we look at the right to abortion, we understand that it does not fall under the right to privacy. In the right to privacy, we must look at all individuals and institutions that are involved in the matter. No longer is the involvement in the matter between the mother and her physician and now involves the state and federal government granting these rights and many times the tax funding and involves the physician the mother and the unborn child abortion is no longer nor was it ever a matter of privacy it is a matter of whose rights are being infringed upon and spoiler alert it's not the mother's lack of information in this section quotations from margaret sanger will be included. These quotations may be triggering to some individuals, so reader discretion is advised. Many of those who are in favor of abortion tend to lack knowledge on the matter. Some claim it to be a constitutional right, whereas above we dismantle that argument entirely. Some claim the right to abortion is better for the world, for women, and for society. But many overlook who abortion actually affects. In the section labeled statistics, we will be looking at the numbers more specifically. But allow us to look at some history behind the abortion movement. A key leader in the abortion movement is the abortion provider Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was founded in 1916 by Margaret Sanger. Planned Parenthood prides themselves by claiming the institution delivers vital reproductive health care, sex education, and information to millions of women, men, and young people worldwide. One of the vital reproductive health care operations they provide is abortion. Surface level, Planned Parenthood sounds like an institution that supports individuals on their journey through reproduction or lack thereof. But when looking closer into the history of the institution, it would be hard to imagine even the major advocates for abortion to stand behind. Planned Parenthood was started by Margaret Sanger in 1916. But who was Margaret Sanger and why did she establish Planned Parenthood? 
Margaret Sanger is known for opening the first birth control clinic in the United States and being an advocate for reproductive rights of women. However, her past and reasoning for these rights are a very dark thing. Margaret Sanger is known to be an advocate for women, but many do not know she's also an advocate for eugenics. Specifically, eugenics to cause the stop of reproduction of a certain group of individuals. In her, An Autobiography by Margaret Sanger, she recounts a talk she was invited to speak at during her advocacy for reproductive rights. She said, Always, to me, any aroused group was a good group, and therefore, I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan at Silver Lake, New Jersey, one of the weirdest experiences I had in lecturing. In the end, through simple illustrations, I believed I accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. Margaret Sanger explains that she was invited to speak in front of the Ku Klux Klan, which she referred to as a good group, if they were interested in the topic of abortion. In her autobiography, she also notes the increase of the birth rate of groups of individuals and how controlling the birth rate would be beneficial. She said, from the eugenic standpoint, there had been a rapid increase in the stature of the Dutch conscript, as shown by army records. The data proved conclusively that a controlled birth rate was beneficial, as I had imagined it would be. But who were these individuals that Sanger thought would benefit from the slow of birth rate of certain groups? And who were these groups that she wanted to slow the birth rate of? One group of individuals that Sanger thought would be beneficial to slow down the rate of are those who one would consider unfit. She said, I accepted one branch of this philosophy, but eugenics without birth control seemed to me as a house built upon sand. It could not stand against the furious winds of economic pressure, which had buffeted into partial or total helplessness a tremendous proportion of the human race. The eugenists wanted to shift the birth control emphasis from less children for the poor to more children for the rich. When we went back off that and sought first to stop the multiplication of the unfit, this appeared the most important and greatest step towards race betterment. The question arises as to who Margaret Sanger is referring to as unfit in her eyes. I do not want to delve much deeper into who she sees as unfit because I do not think anyone is unfit for the world. Everyone deserves the right to life as the UN Declaration states. Margaret Sanger would not agree though. In a letter she wrote to Dr. Gamble in 1939, Sanger says one of the most disgusting things ever to be written. Because I fear to be misquoted, I will include the letter here. Please read. It will open your eyes to who Sanger really was. Now, right here, I show the letter that Margaret Sanger wrote to Dr. Campbell. Now, I'm not going to be reading it out loud, and I'm not going to be writing it out either. But if you want to see it, please go to the article. I have images of the letter. Now, the reason why I am not going to quote the letter is because I don't want to be misquoted and ever accused of saying these things. And also, it's just so disgusting to read. In this letter, Margaret Singer talks about how she wants to exterminate a group and don't let the people know that that's her plan. Just read the letter. It's entirely disgusting. Margaret Singer was not an advocate for women's rights. She was an advocate for removing those in the world who she saw as unfit. With this information and quotations, we can understand that Sanger had a clear eye for who she saw was unfit and the creation of Planned Parenthood was to stop the growth of who she saw was unfit. Many individuals do not know the history of the Planned Parenthood institution, nor do they understand why it was created. This is a scary thing because many people are advocates for this institution, but many lack the information that is vital in creating a stance on the topic. So now we're moving on to the statistics section of the article. The numbers. 
623,471 legally induced abortions took place in 2016, according to the CDC. 186 abortions for every 1,000 live births in 2016, according to the CDC. 60,236,165 American lives lost to abortion since 1972, according to liveaction.org. 647,457 deaths in 2017 caused by heart disease, according to the CDC. 599,108 deaths caused by cancer in 2017, according to the CDC. 169,201 deaths caused by accidents in 2017, according to the CDC. The numbers conclusion. Looking at the numbers, we can see what the leading causes of death in the United States are, according to the CDC. Deaths caused by heart disease, cancer, and accidents are considered the leading causes of deaths in the United States. When looking at the numbers of deaths caused by abortion in comparison to the deaths caused by other leading causes, we can understand that abortion is a leading cause of death in the United States. That's a problem. We go through so many measures to shrink the number of deaths caused by other leading causes. When is abortion as a leading cause going to be combated? Now we're going to move on to the home stretch of this article. And this is the part of the article where I talk about myself. And this will be beneficial to you when I respond, when I show the response to my professor that I wrote. But pay attention to the relevance to the author, which is me. My name is Vanessa. Many people do not know me, at least the depths of who I am as a person. When you see me, I just look like your average female college student trying to make a mark on this world. Let me tell you a little bit more about me and hopefully it will help you understand my purpose for the passion I have behind being an advocate for the unborn. I am a 22 year old female. I was born in Los Angeles, California. I am half Latina and half Scandinavian. Part of me comes from Mexico where the other portion comes from Sweden. My grandfather was an immigrant from Mexico, making me a second generation. I am conservative. I have financial hardships at times. I did not grow up rich. I grew up on the poorer end of the spectrum. There are many qualities of myself that would lead for people to see me as unfit. For example, I'm a woman. I'm poor. I'm Mexican. I'm conservative. I have glasses. I'm 5'1 and many others. Fortunately for me, today's society sees me as valuable in some way, whereas in a different year, country, society, etc., I may not be so fortunate. There are people in the world who are preyed upon because of their race, their economic status, their sex, their age, their class. Fortunately, for many groups, there are advocates who fight day in and day out for everyone to have rights and to be considered valuable. Yet there is a disproportionate advocacy for the most innocent life on earth, the unborn. I do not think my life is more valuable than anyone else's, nor should anyone else think that of themselves. But there is a group of individuals who walk around with a name, Women's Rights Advocates who infringe on the rights of others and claim their lives are more valuable than those of a different group, that different group being the unborn. I know of so many people in the world that would be considered not valuable or unfit in the eyes of those advocates. There are people who stand for my rights as a human, so I will not leave behind the most innocent lives who also need people to stand for their lives. Fortunately for myself, I have a say in my life. I can vote. I can make my own decisions. But I did not always have these capabilities. At one point, I was also in the womb, innocent, relying on my mother to protect me. I was lucky in this life to have a mother who was pro-life because I sure as heck did not deserve to be here any more than the over 600,000 babies who are killed every year due to abortion. I was premature. I was not fully developed to full term when I was born. 
Was my life any less valuable than those who make it to full term? Was my life any more valuable than those who have yet to make it to the point of development that I was at? The answer to those questions are no. My life is not more valuable than anyone else's life. I am not worth more than a 99 year old grandma. I am not worth more than a one year old baby. I am not worth more than a 45 year old man. I am not worth more than a baby at the time of conception and neither are you. And then I go on to show my references. They're also in the description bar down below. I'm making sure I protect myself and also I have them on the blog. And if you look at my references, the only, the only pro-life site I quote is liveaction.org and that was just to get the number of how many babies have been murdered since 1972. Every other number I have here, every other fact, every other statistic is from either nonpartisan websites, Planned Parenthood, or Margaret Sanger herself. So I didn't lead this article with going like, I'm pro-life and here's why I'm pro-life and here's all these pro-life articles and statistics. Instead, I wrote this article from a standpoint where I got all of my information from the people who advocate for abortion. And yeah, I wrote an article going against abortion. And if you sat through this entire thing, you can see that my article wasn't ever so pro-life. I don't even think a pro-life website would publish my article because it's not pro-life enough. All I did was provide information to my professor, to my reader, to inform them on information that they are given, to tell them about the ill intent of Margaret Sanger and the ill intent of how Planned Parenthood was started. That's what my paper is on. So when we look back to the response that my professor gave me on this paper, it's kind of confusing because first of all, it seems like she didn't read my paper because she's claiming I made certain points that I didn't. And number two, I never once mentioned in my paper that I'm Catholic. That is from prior knowledge that she had about me. She decided to bring my faith into the conversation, which was totally inappropriate. And we're gonna get into that later. But to remind you, let us read what but my professor responded to my article. Hi Vanessa, thank you for your time and efforts into this project. While your opinions are certainly valid, I would like to state that just by showing that a member of an organization had ill intent doesn't prove that a whole organization is ill in its intent. Would it be a fair argument if I said that Catholic Church is ill-intended based upon the history of many of its leaders and its history is rich in murder, violence against groups of people, rape, etc. Also, to be correct, from a medical standpoint, aside from spiritual beliefs upon conception, a baby is not formed. It is simply a cluster of cells. Many doctors defer to pregnancy simply as a medical diagnosis. In fact, referring to it as a baby is technically wrong. A baby does not form until the cells form together to form a heartbeat, which does not occur until about the eighth week at which point it becomes a fetus. Thank you for your time and effort into this project and you are free to publish your post. So when we read her response and we read my paper, we can see that one, she is not replying to what is in my paper and two, she's putting words in my mouth and there was no need for her to bring up the Catholic Church, especially since I didn't bring up the Catholic Church. Now, I was going to sit down and break this down for you guys and talk about what, like, what I would reply to her, but instead I decided to write her an email. Now, at this point that I'm filming this video, I have not decided whether or not I'm going to send out the email. I was going to reply to her forum post, but I didn't want the rest of the class seeing me kind of make the teacher look stupid how she made me look stupid because I respect her. She is an elder to me. I should respect her opinion as she should respect mine and not make her look like an idiot on the forum. So I decided that I would write her an email. Now this email is very lengthy and I have not sent it out and I don't even know if I'll ever send it out just because of how lengthy it is. But I figured what I wrote in this email explains exactly how I feel about this entire thing that's going on and so that you guys can get a better understanding of what I want to say because if not, I'm just going to ramble. I think that this explains it perfectly. So 
get prepared. This one's a little lengthy as well, but I trust me, I'm very, I'm actually proud about this email too, as I'm proud about the article, but let's read the email. Hello, professor. Thank you for taking the time to read my article and commenting on it. Based off your comment, it seems to me that you may have misunderstood or misread what my article contained. In your comment, you mentioned that because a member of an organization has ill intent does not make the organization as a whole have ill intent. I am 100% behind you on that. Trust me, I know what it's like to be pushed into a generalized category based on one person's actions. I would never fall guilty of using that fallacy in my arguments. I mentioned the ill intent of Margaret Sanger because she is the founder of Planned Parenthood organization. The purpose of the creation of this organization disguised as being a place for women's reproduction rights was to exterminate the community she saw to be unfit. That was the purpose behind starting the organization. I never claimed that the organization still had those purposes or goals. I was educating my audience on the ill beginnings of the organization. My whole article, as mentioned in my article, was to educate my readers on the topic. I was providing them with information that is often covered up or hidden from them so that they can make their own opinions on the matter. Many people make opinions blindly. They follow what their parents, teachers, religious leaders say and never question it. I never have a belief solely based off what I've been told. I always research the topic before I make an opinion. And I was encouraging my readers to do so as well. Don't take my word for it. I always tell people, don't trust me, test me. I encourage people to do the same with everything. Mind you, by the way, the don't trust me, test me thing, I got that from How To Be Christian, they use in their videos. I'll have his channel linked down below because I stole that from him. Just trying to not get played, like be accused of plagiarism. So yeah, he said that first. Anyways, in your comments, you mentioned the Catholic Church to prove your point. I was taken aback by this. Never once in my article do I mention my faith as a Christian, yet you thought it was appropriate to mention the shortcomings of a group I identify as to prove your point. That was very inappropriate. If I had mentioned in the article that I was Catholic, then that would be another thing. You would have had justification behind your comment. I put justification in parentheses because even then you would have been overstepping. First of all, I have no problem having a discussion with anyone about the history of the Catholic Church and the shortcomings you mentioned, but there's a place and a time for that, and this was not that time. It was inappropriate for you to mention. If I had been of any other religion group other than Christianity, would you have done the same? Mind you, I didn't even mention I was Catholic in my article. You mentioned this based off prior knowledge of me, information about myself that I shared with the class and you because I felt safe. But now I'm aware that in this classroom environment, I have to be a little more cautious when I talk about my personal life because it may get attacked in a conversation that doesn't even have to do with the topic. Another thing I'd like to mention or ask, where are you getting your information from on the Catholic Church to make those statements? In my article, when I mentioned the ill intent and history of Margaret Sanger, I backed up my argument with factual information. I was proving my point with facts, whereas you made a blanket statement without providing any factual information. I understand that this is a forum comment and it would not make sense for you to do a literature review on the Catholic Church in your comments, but it also did not make sense for you to mention it in the first place. In my article, I mentioned many qualities about myself. For example, that I'm Mexican, second generation, a woman, etc. Those were qualities and facts about myself I shared within my article that you could have used as an example to prove your point. Yet you decided to go for my religion to prove your point. That was 100% inappropriate. But I get it. You were probably hated or upset by my article and the information it contained. But in the future, be a little more careful when commenting on someone or their faith when it is not appropriate. The next paragraph of your comment, you attempted to correct me on the definition of baby. In my article, I never mentioned when I believed for the baby to be a baby in the womb. I never talked about at what point it's considered cells. 
what point it has a heartbeat, what point it feels pain, etc. Why? Because that was not the basis of my article. My article was highlighting on the misinformation or lack of information provided to people who are advocates for abortion. I feel as though you did not read my article when I read your second paragraph because you were addressing something that was not even stated. You said, aside from spiritual beliefs when correcting me, as though I had made my opinion off spiritual beliefs. Once again, you're mentioning my faith to undermine my opinion. Never once in my article did I mention faith as being the basis for my opinion. And you want to know why? It's because it isn't. I am not an advocate for the unborn because of my faith. I am an advocate for the unborn because of my belief in facts and in science. We can discuss whether or not it is a baby another time, but arguing about what's a baby and what isn't in a comment on an article that didn't even mention it seems a little bit inappropriate and strange. Professor, I would also like to remind you that this class is an art class, not a science class, not a persuasion class, not a political science class, but art. To attempt to start an argument slash discussion with me on those topics in the comment section of the class forum is not the proper thing to do. You left comments praising all the other students in the class for their hard work on their articles, yet you only responded to mine in an argumentative way, reminding you, arguing on things that weren't even mentioned in the article. If you want to have an abortion conversation at any point in the future, I will be happy to, but this was not the time and the place for it. Thank you. So guys, that was the response that I created and I wrote for my professor. And I feel like it really explains a lot that I wanted to explain in this video. First of all, she mentioned my religion when I never mentioned my religion in the article. I've mentioned it in the past. I mean, I have a laptop that says that one Catholic girl on it, but I never mentioned it in the article. And so therefore it was inappropriate for her to bring it up. Even if I did say I was Catholic in the article when I mentioned my other qualities, it still would have been inappropriate for her to bring up the shortcomings of the Catholic church especially since she had no facts to back it up. Now I understand she can't turn in a literature review to me about the Catholic Church because that would be like inappropriate. That would be too much for her to write like pages and pages of stuff on the Catholic Church in a forum post comment. But you have to recognize that it was inappropriate for her in the first place to even bring up the Catholic Church in this conversation. She also tried to undermine my opinion by saying it was based off spiritual beliefs when it was never based off spiritual beliefs. She instead decided to include the fact that I'm Catholic and say, oh, this is why she made this article. This is why she's making this statement. Guys, I've never successfully argued the topic of abortion from a Catholic standpoint. Now, I believe as Catholics, as Christians, we're against murder in every way, but I've never successfully argued it from a Catholic slash Christian standpoint. I've only ever argued abortion when it comes to science and facts. It's never been a religion-based thing. I am not pro-life because I'm Catholic. I mean, being Catholic helps my belief system, but I'm not pro-life because I'm Catholic. I'm pro-life because I look at science. I look at facts. I don't just repeat what people say on the news. I don't repeat what people write in their dumb articles online. I research for myself. And if you notice, like how I mentioned, if you go to the reference section, the people who I quote in the reference section are Planned Parenthood, the CDC, and Margaret Sanger herself. Margaret Sanger said all of this stuff. And so when my professor, makes the comment that it's based off spiritual beliefs or that though my opinion is valid as though this paper is a paper on opinions. It's not. If you read the paper like how I've read it to you guys, you would know that this paper is not an opinion paper. This paper was an informative paper. I just gave you facts. I just informed you on stuff. So I have mentioned that in the past I have received some pushback from professors, but usually it's us chatting in their office and I never have it documented. And so when I tell people about the pushback I get from professors, a lot of people like to go like, that never happened to me in college, that never happened to me. And so right here, because we're in the situation where we have to interact through comments and through forum posts, I have it documented. Now, 
on this paper, on this article, I got 100% and this is something I'm going to be very transparent about. I got 100% on it because this paper was a pass or fail paper. If you didn't do the work, you got a zero. If you did the work, you got 100. So I did the work and I got 100% on this paper. Now, I wanted in this video to include the comments that she left to other students, but I thought that was overstepping and I thought that was inappropriate because I have a radar for what is inappropriate and what is overstepping. So I decided not to include their comments. But if I could just paraphrase, it was like, awesome, you're so brave. Thank you for writing this. Wow, I didn't know about ocean pollution. Great stuff. Not great stuff, ocean pollution, but great, great articles, stuff like that. I was the only person who got attacked for my beliefs. And I wouldn't even put it so much as attacked. I don't mind you having your opinions. I don't mind you wanting to create conversation with me. But don't First of all, bring my religion into it when I didn't bring it in myself. There was no reason for you to bring my religion into it. And then she also tried to say that, oh, my basis of belief, even though I provided her with so many facts, she tried to say my basis of belief was based off my spiritual beliefs when I never even brought up that I was Catholic. It was just such a strange situation that I involved myself in. She just, she stepped out of line and it was so inappropriate. I am making this video, not so much so that I could go like, yeah, school sucks for me, because honestly, I really liked college, you know? I really like it. I like being able to write these papers and get a reaction out of my professors, but I'm making this video because there are a lot of young conservatives going to liberal colleges. You know, there's young conservatives, there's young Catholics, there's young Catholic conservatives. There's a lot of us out there who sometimes are fearful of stating our opinions and stating our points because you are afraid of pushback like this. I have been called racist in class. I've been called a woman hater in class. And so I always lead with, other than, hi, I'm Vanessa, I'm Catholic. I always lead with, I'm Mexican and I'm a woman, which I think they can tell, but I always lead with that because I realize that that is my leverage in a conversation. But a lot of people are not so fortunate to have that leverage. So I make this video to encourage others to, you know what, don't let your professors shut you up. Don't let your professors think you're that you're scared of them. Because you know what, a lot of the times, a lot of conservatives who go into college and are shut up by the professors end up walking out as liberals. Don't let that be you. Don't let someone come at you and tell you that your beliefs are invalid when they read your paper and it's almost like they didn't actually read your paper. I really, really suggest let's create diversity of thought. You know, in college, everyone thinks the same thing. Be that different mind. You know, write a paper that maybe will get your professor mad. And if it does get your professor mad, you have so many people behind you, so many conservatives, so many Catholics, so many Christians behind you that want to support you in your success. So if they do give you a bad grade because you wrote a paper pro-gun, pro-life, whatever it may be that made your professor upset, you know, write to your news organization and let them know. Make a YouTube video about it. Let them know. Let people know what is going on because it's sickening and it's upsetting. So guys, if you guys liked my article and you guys want to read it for yourself, I'll have it linked down below. Also, there were the timestamps, but we're at the end of the video. If you stuck around to the end of this video, please let me know in the comments I'd really like to know if anyone stuck around for this long. If you liked my article, let me know. And if you didn't like my article and you hated it, also let me know. I want to know why. Let's have this discussion because I'm encouraging you. Have this discussion in the description bar. By the way, I'm stating that I'm Catholic, so you can totally attack that if you want in the description bar. We'll have the conversation about it because now it's an appropriate time. It's an appropriate time. In class, it wasn't, but now it's appropriate, so we can chat about it if you want. So like I said, if you like this video, please give it a like. If you didn't like it, give it a dislike. If you like me and you want to see more of me, my name is Vanessa, just in case you forgot, please hit that subscribe button and also hit that bell notification so you know when I post or you know when I go live. I'll be talking about this in my live streams for the years to come. So if you guys want to have a full-on conversation with me, stop by the live streams. And I love you guys so much. I thank you guys so much for all the love and support you provide me. I love you all. And I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Bye.